AI Mentors is brought to you by Aulis International, covering your business's staffing, consulting and networking needs. Our podcast, AI Mentors, brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success and their advice. Focusing on fast tracking you to the top, AI Mentors cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. Welcome to AI Mentors. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Eben Esterhazen. Eben is the Senior Director of Data Science for Shiris and Associates. Eben, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? Doing great, thank you. Um, so Eben, if you wouldn't mind starting with a bit of a background of yourself, how you chose a career in, in AI, data science, and what's led you to your current role right now. Uh, well, originally from South Africa, I studied actuarial mathematics at university and I've always been fascinated by numbers and you know, predicting trends in society. Um, so after university, I, um, I went into the startup world. That brought me to America. I lived in Los Angeles for a while, from Los Angeles to New York. Um, so more sort of working on Wall Street, working in tech startups, and then eventually started my own alternative data company. Uh, specifically building sort of very unique data sets for hedge funds. Um, and then during that time was when I discovered machine learning for the very first time. A friend kind of took me aside and was like, hey, have you seen this new thing called Weka? Very old school interface. It was from New Zealand. It was this very cool interface where you just like upload a data set, press a button, and it would just like build a decision tree for you. And you can kind of look under the hood, like what the data was saying. And I thought that was very revolutionary, you know, for what I was doing at the time. And that was really the beginning of you know this very exciting journey into the data science world. So, could you describe briefly what your your current role is, and and a little bit more about what Shiris and Associates do? So, as I mentioned, been in the financial space for a very long time, and you know, worked at big financial data companies. Um, I worked for Intercontinental, Intercontinental Exchange, uh, the owner of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and then from there, went back to the, the tech industry, um, Garrett Sherison. Uh, we are a consultancy firm using machine learning to do market research um, to also develop targeted advertising solutions for major tech and media companies. Um, so that's my day job. And then on the side, I love you know, focusing on daily fantasy sports. You know, I, I do some reinforcement learning algorithms there. Uh, also very interested in doing some natural language processing research in the cryptocurrency space. So that's essentially what's been going on in the last couple of months. Could you give any insight to any any interesting or exciting projects you're involved in right now? Absolutely. So we, as I mentioned, we do quite a bit of market research for, um, for tech clients uh, and media companies. Um, so for example, if, if a tech client was interested in launching a new product, we would do the surveys to collect some feedback from the potential consumer base about how they might interact with a new product. Um, we would then collect all this data about how people perceive brands and perceive product features and solutions. And then we would build algorithms to try and predict adoption trends within the market for certain types of products. Um, and then ultimately take those insights coming from the machine learning algorithms to the clients so that they can deliver a product that you know, speaks to what the market's looking for, but then ultimately also develop actionable insights for them to go to market with you know, a, a coherent marketing strategy around the product that they develop. So at a very high level, those are the types of work that we do. We also do a ton of work in the television industry. So um, building advanced advertising solutions for um, what's called linear television companies. So just you know, cable television companies and really figuring out how adverts should be placed on networks to, to maximize reach or hit rate for the advertiser. With your current role and, and obviously the, the side projects that you're heavily involved in, what are the, the trends and hot topics that you're currently seeing within data science and, and the wider AI community? I think it's quite interesting when you talk to sort of industries outside of tech and finance um, about machine learning, you know, a lot of people read the media and they, and they think of AI, you know, like it's fairy dust. And, you know, the media tends to create these very sensationalist headlines about the capabilities of AI. And, you know, everyone, everyone agrees that it has the potential to have massive impact on society. But, you know, the, the question about whether it's going to be a net positive for society isn't exactly clear at the moment. So that, in my mind, is 
know, fundamentally a very big question for everyone at the moment. Because you're gonna have this one scenario where you know, the world of AI research could potentially split into two. So you might have um, you know, on the one side in the US where AI research is primarily funded by the private sector and the main incentive there is to maximize profits. But then on the other side of the world in China, um, AI is primarily funded by the state and the incentives there are slightly different, right? So from recent examples, it's become clear that um, the Chinese show an intention to use this technology for mass surveillance of citizens and um, especially minorities. So it's this idea that you have these bifurcation of AI over the next couple of years and this concept that AI really amplifies our abilities as a society and at this moment we can choose to amplify either the good parts of AI or the bad parts of AI and to me that's you know one of the big fundamental questions that, that we have at the moment as a society. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's a very important uh, point to touch on and um, a lot of interesting challenges lay ahead on both sides. Yep. Um, focusing on the goods and, and what what use AI can provide um, to improve our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, um, mm -hmm. there's, there's certain examples that you can look at. Um, where do you see the biggest impact to society? Oh, there's so many good examples. I mean, I'm, I'm a very optimistic guy. Um, so if you just think of like the new discoveries uh, with drugs that are being um, fueled with AI, um, just every other day you hear about someone building a new algorithm to detect diseases you know, more effectively. A lot of work is being done within the educational space. So trying to build algorithms that personalize learning experiences for students, that can have massive implications for society at large. Um, you know, just the idea of having an AI tutor, you know, that takes you from reading for the very first time all the way up to your higher levels of education. It's a very powerful concept and something I'm super excited about. So, so and just that's, that's just a handful of examples. I mean, there's so much more you can do with AI, um, you know, on the, on the good side. But, um, you know, sadly, with every good example, you can also come up with like an evil application of AI. You know, we, there's a lot of talk about deep fake videos being the next, you know, approach to, to destabilize democracies. Um, a lot of people um, are very aware of obviously what happened during recent election cycles uh, in the US and the UK. So it's this idea that you can use AI to target susceptible people and advertise fake news you know, directly at them. Um, it's obviously bad if AI is used in crime prediction algorithms. That's a new sort of industry that's really blossoming at the moment. Or oh, these algorithms are trained on data sets that have built-in biases in them you know, that's just inevitably going to amplify these biases. And, and that's, that's something that's very troubling and, you know, potentially a net negative society going forward. Absolutely. Yeah, we've already seen the, the massive impact and, and it could lead to um, even, even bigger impact going forward if we don't figure out how to take out the historical data biases that obviously exist yeah. from personal choice. A couple of years ago, everyone thought, the AI world takeover would be like killer robots flying around and shooting up, you know, cities and, you know, making humans you know, irrelevant. But it turns out that it was just a couple of bots on Twitter and that's all you really needed to destabilize democracy. And um, that's, that's a very frightening thing. This idea that the AI takeover has already happened and that, you know, a lot of this AI isn't extremely sophisticated, but it's being extremely effective and, you know, how it's being deployed. And, you know, we talk a lot about the negative side, but like that's, to me, you know, one of the big concerns is that society might just turn on AI as a technology, you know, without considering all the positives that can come from it. Here at Aldis, we want to make the hiring process easier for all. Whether you're an employer or an aspiring employee, we have the service for you. For full-time work, Aldis will partner with you to find the best person for the position. Using both our network and our rigorous qualification process, we ensure that only the best talent is shortlisted. We will manage the process and work with you to select our most suitable candidate for your organisation. We also offer excellent temp hiring services. At Aldis, we provide a great opportunity to help you and our candidate make the right choice. The contract period is one long interview for your full-time opening and the extended experience with our consultant helps you make the best decision. Aldous International is here to quickly help you find the best AI candidate. Our experts stay in close contact with our consultants throughout the duration of the contract, ensuring they have everything they need to get the job done.
when when you and I met last week, you, you were talking about some of the, the the amazing advances, even in a short period of time of over a couple of months. Could you give us some more detail of uh, advancements that you've noticed that stand out? Yeah, I mean, it, it speaks very nicely to what we just talked about. You know, so as a society, we're we're at this point now where we have to take you know the unicorns and rainbows route with AI or go down this very dubby and gloomy. Uh, world of AI surveillance and you know misapplying the technology. Um, so as a society, we've we've approached this point now where we need to have deep and open discussions about how we use AI in our society. But you have this massive problem that most of these algorithms are just black boxes, and it's something that that's very confusing for the industry. It's very confusing for regulators, um, and obviously for Joe Soap on the street, he doesn't know like the impact AI has on his life. But um, some of the recent advances are very encouraging. I think last year in June, there was a big breakthrough in the world of model explainability. Um, explainable AI, if I had to kind of pick one topic, I think it's gonna be one of the most important things over the next couple of years in machine learning, uh, is this idea that you can take a black box model and basically ask it why it's making predictions at the individual level. So for example, if there's a, let's say I'm trying to predict if someone's gonna be buying a certain product and I can look at the web pages that they visited over the last six months, um, I might have 500 variables going into this, you know, 500 websites that they may have visited. And you know, the model might come up and say like, we think it's 60% likely this person might buy this product. But as a human, you don't really know like what the main factors were in that decision. Assuming it was like a very black box model, like a neural net or, you know, boosted tree model or something like that. But now with the latest technologies, uh, and I'm going to get to those in a moment, you can actually query the machine and can actually tell you, because this person went to this website, um, is a 5% increase in the probability that they're going to buy this product. Because they didn't go to this website, there's a 10% decrease in probability that they're going to buy this product and so on and so on. So you can actually, for every individual in your sample, you can get an explanation from the model about why it made the decisions that it made. Now that, that's a very basic example, but that becomes extremely powerful when you think about situations where AI is being used to determine really the future of someone's life. So imagine an algorithm deciding who gets admitted into college or not. You know, one of the factors might be race, you know, and maybe the fact that someone is in a minority decreases their probability of being accepted by, you know, 10%. As a society, that would be very helpful to know that that was one of the reasons why the AI rejected someone from getting into a good school. And as a society, we then have the ability to have an open discussion about whether that's okay or not. And basically, if, it's, if we all agree, I think everyone agree that that's probably not a good thing, we can then go back to the model design and actually change it so that it doesn't have that bias so that it makes a better decision, so that we as humans can all then agree that this model is making decisions that are based on principles that we all agree on as a society, and this model is likely to make the world a better place. And you can only have that discussion if you can actually explain what the model is doing. And to me, that's an area that's, that's super exciting. Absolutely, I think it's one major hurdle that um, needs to be addressed in order for AI to be broadly accepted and it's all going to come down to trust in the recommendations and predictions and as long as there's a clear logic behind decisions or suggestions, inevitably people will, will trust in the recommendations and which will only lead it to be more uh, widely adopted. Could you give our listeners some um, insight of to where they could get access to this, what they should be looking at themselves, and, and how they could upskill in this area? One of the first places to start with is a, um, a package called SHAP, essentially short for Shapley Additive Explanations. It's a, um, a package in Python you can just download directly. Um, it's got great documentation. Um, it's written by a... Um, an author, I think his name's Lindberg. Um, he's just, it's, it's a great repo, loads of notebooks with great examples, um, how you can take tree models to, to explain to you exactly at the individual level why certain predictions are being made. You can also feed it a black box sklearn model and essentially give some kind of local approximation of like why it's making decisions. It's extremely powerful. 
Um, it's very lightweight. You can run it on your laptop and I highly encourage your, your listeners to kind of experiment with that technology. It's very interesting. So Shep is one of the more recent ones. Um, Lime is another um, model that, that you could use. Essentially, uh, that package, they use sort of linear approximations of decisions being made by algorithms. Um, Lime is especially useful for um, image classification and for text classification. So again, check out the documentation because there are some very interesting examples of how a machine vision algorithm, um, for example, is trained to try and predict whether a, a wolf is in an image or not. And you can then you know, train your algorithm and maybe you get you know, 95% accuracy in predicting wolves and pictures. Um, and then you can feed the Lime algorithm specific photos and you can see the, so the regions in the photo that the algorithm decided uh, was important when making a decision about you know, predicting wolf or not wolf. What's interesting is sometimes you see um, the algorithm might have picked up on the fact that um, there's snow in the background. So that's the reason why it thinks it's a wolf, right? So if your training data had a lot of photos of wolves, you know, in snowy environments, the algorithm may have picked up on the fact that snow is associated with wolves and that may be creating, you know, some fake accuracy in your data. So having that ability to very quickly understand why the algorithm is making certain classifications is extremely powerful. So that example is directly from the documentation of Lime and um, very intuitive to use. I encourage you both, um, I encourage you all to go check out both Shep and Lime uh, within the Python uh, repositories. Excellent. Thank you for that recommendation, even. Um, so bringing, bringing it back then to yourself and in particular advice for engineers, scientists, developers, you uh, at Shurison recently uh, went through rapid growth where you um, almost doubled in, in size over a six month period. When you look at the, the dynamics of your team now, obviously a broad spectrum of background and diverse skill sets. When somebody comes in to interview for your group, how do they communicate to you that they're more than just a set of skills and a, a degree? What, what else can they talk about that's going to stand out to you when you're assessing a, an individual's suitability for not just a role, but the culture of, of your group? Essentially, we would be looking for someone who has spent a lot of time solving very difficult problems. And um, it's always very interesting to me asking someone to describe a difficult problem that they worked on and then how they ended up solving that problem. And by asking that very simple question, it becomes very clear who, who's the sort of the cookie cutter candidate who's done sort of the bare minimum just to kind of get into the field compared to someone who's truly passionate about the work that they do. Because if you're really trying to solve a difficult problem, you're going to be very, uh, you're going to have a great awareness of the complexities that lie underneath the problem and being able to communicate what those problems were and how you solve them is a very valuable trait for someone on our team because a lot of what we do is take complicated problems and package it in ways where our clients can, can understand it and are also you know, improve on the insights that we provide to them. So it's, it's that ability to take a difficult problem simplify it, solve the problem, and then communicate how you've solved it effectively. That is a critical skill, it's a soft skill, and it's really one of the, one of the skills that you can only develop over time by practicing a lot. You've been listening to AI Mentors with Eben Esther Hazen. Eben, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Get the Aldous advantage. Become a member of the Aldous community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to all us members. And don't forget our AI in Action podcast. Each week, we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career, and more. Become an Aldous member and get the Aldous advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldous.com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.